jump right in and uh, start telling you a little bit about our work at Mass LBP. So Ma Mass LBP is a, a small company. Right now we're, uh, we're four people, uh, but we work with a, a stable of facilitators and writers and designers all across the country. Um, I've been with the company in various different uh, respects for the last six years since it was founded here in Toronto in a, a little basement apartment. We quickly found our way to, uh, to a little storefront down on King Street East, uh, just north of the distillery district. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, feel free to drop by and uh, say hello to me and the rest of my staff. Um, and over the last six years now, we've, uh, we've racked up a good 75 different projects, all focused on reinventing public consultation. Um, across the country, we've worked in the health sector with uh, local health networks, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, um, Toronto Central Lynn, uh, the Southeast Lynn in uh, and Kingston, we've worked with CCACs, with hospitals. Uh, in the nonprofit sector, we've worked with the YMCA, we've worked with the United Way of Toronto. Um, in the governmental area, we've worked with the Ministry of Consumer Services on rewriting the Condominium Act. Uh, and we've also worked with uh, Metrolinx, our regional transit planning agency here in the, the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And they're, uh, they're tasked with coming up with a way to fund the next big expansion in transit improvement in our city. So we were talking to them and to the public about how to go about doing that. Uh, so we've got a wide range of experience over the last six years. Um, but we've been focusing on reinventing public consultation, well, really because we think a lot of public consultation is pretty useless. And I, I'm not sure if you guys have you know, been to a town hall or uh, participated in a phone poll recently, but there are some cases when it doesn't do us a lot of service and it doesn't seem to do uh, the organization a lot of, a lot of service themselves. Um, but to get us started, I think a, a good way to illustrate this is actually to turn to the good people at NBC. Is anyone here a, a fan of Amy Poehler, the comedian, or Parks and Recreation, uh, the TV show? So before they, you know, the, before their premiere, they put together this clip, which I think captures it really precisely. It's funny because there's a grain of truth to it, right? We've all been at that meeting where there's like six people sitting around. Um, so, so what's going on here, right? We seem to, be, seem to be doing this thing where we're wasting our time as organizations. We're wasting people's time who are coming out and telling us about what they want and what they feel is important. And we seem to just be kind of going through the motions. And public consultation and public engagement is increasingly embedded in our public sector organizations. This is something that seems to be required now. Um, and yet, most of the ways we go about it don't seem to be actually helping anybody. So it's, it's a little bit of a puzzle, and I'm going to spend uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes talking about uh, where I think that puzzle is coming from, uh, and then talk a little bit about what some of the solutions that we propose um, and some of the things that you can take with you uh, when you are uh, going about planning your next public consultation. Uh, some of the questions and some of the goals that you want, might want to keep in mind uh, to make sure that you can do it effectively. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about some of the kind of traditional formats of, uh, of public consultation. Uh, one is the town hall, right? This is supposed to be kind of the paragon of democracy. Uh, you get a big room, the, the bigger the better, uh, and you invite as many people as possible. Everyone, you try to get them all out. Uh, and then usually what happens is um, you put the decision maker kind of at the front behind a table or a podium and then you, you stick the public, you know, kind of on the other side of the room kind of facing each other. Uh, and for the first while, the decision maker talks for a while, tries to explain something to people. Uh, there's often too many slides uh, and a lot of confusing 
<laughs> jargon, and, and, and people get kind of frustrated because they don't know what's going on and they're wasting your time. And, and then they turn it over to the audience and there's this single microphone in the middle of the room and people have to line up behind that microphone um, and do something that I think everybody really hates, which is public speaking, right? Like it's, it's on the list of you know, greatest fears up there with you know, heights and snakes and airplanes. Public speaking is, is a really hard thing for most people to do. And yet that's the way we're asking them to provide feedback. So the only people who are gonna stand up there are probably gonna be really upset. Uh, because they're the only people who have got enough courage to get up and, and really talk, and they're already doing something really hard, so it's not surprising that these town halls often go right off the rails really quickly. And we've all, I, at least I've been in a few of these meetings where things just kind of descend, and we all kind of sit back and wait for it to end, mm -hmm. and then walk out of there thinking, you know, what, what the hell was that? Um, if that was supposed to be a public dialogue, it, it certainly failed in a lot of ways. So a lot of people then say, why don't we take this online, right? We now all have cell phones and laptops and personal computers. It's a much more comfortable way for us to engage in a discussion about the big public issues that we're facing. And I think there's some truth to this. Um, it certainly lets more people get involved. Uh, it'll probably be cheaper for our organizations, right? We don't have to rent a, a hall and buy coffee and donuts and all of that. Um, but I, th I think there's a couple of issues with online engagement. Uh, one of them is that it's generally anonymous, right? I don't really have to take responsibility for what I say. I don't have to take responsibility for providing evidence um, for backing up my perspective. Um, so that's one kind of design problem with an online engagement. The, the second, I think, is a little more complicated, but it's that we, when we're sitting behind screens, we end up losing the ability uh, to pick up on all of the cues that allow us to empathize with people who have a different perspective than we do. Uh, and so I can't see them, I, can't, I, can, I can create an image in my mind of this horrible person who thinks differently than I do and disregard what they think. Um, and third, we're not all great writers, right? Like I write a lot of the time and I still struggle to be coherent and clear. Uh, so it's pretty easy for online engagement to quickly devolve into misunderstandings. And we've all seen the comment section of the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, right? Like there, it's chaos. Um, so we've got to be careful about this. Why don't we take a poll or do a survey, right? Uh, I, th I think there's actually a lot of value to doing a poll. Um, you know, you can, you can get a representative sample of people. You can ask some very focused questions. Um, and you can get some clear responses. Uh, but I don't know about you, uh, the last time I got interrupted for a phone call, I can't remember what it was about, but it, it's because I actually knew nothing about the issue, right? And they were, they were asking me for my opinion about something I had no clue about. So they'd give me some questions and I'd answer a few things and they took that and they ran it through their machine and came up with some stats about what public sentiment was. Um, but there was nothing to say that my opinion about those issues couldn't change the next day. If I learned something different, if I had an interesting conversation. Um, so it's a, it's a volatile bit of information um, and it can change pretty quickly. So it gives you a good snapshot of that moment, but you're really not sure what it means a week or two weeks or a year later. So I think there's some serious issues with polls as well. Right, so the puzzle is we're doing all this stuff, it doesn't seem to be working, and yet engagement is trending. So this is Google search terms um, starting back in the 50s, and then we can see right 2007 there, red is the engagement line. It's like this huge uptick in search terms for engagement. And I, I think we all have experienced that. This word has become a part of our public discourse, and it's taught in our schools, and we talk about it in our workplaces. Um, and yet it seems like many of the methods that we use aren't particularly helpful to anybody. So, so what's going on? Um, so I'm going to walk you through my diagnosis, my explanation um, for why this is happening. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, so an organization faces a tough decision, right? This, this is about, this workshop here is about systems change. Usually system change is focused on something that's pretty tough, a hard problem. It has high stakes for people in the organization and out of it, right? People's jobs, people's services, people's taxes, they're at stake. Uh, whatever decision is made, there's going to be variable consequences. Some people are going to benefit, some people might lose out. Um, there's conflicting values at play, so we might want 
convenience, but we also want cost effectiveness. And we want fairness, but we want efficiency. Uh, and it turns out that in a lot of situations, we can't have it all. We have to choose. Uh, and some people will want one more than the other, but we'll end up having to give one up. And the last thing, uh, which I think is particularly important, is that even after the decision is made, uh, there won't be any real clear resolution about whether it was the right decision or the wrong one. Um, we can't turn back the tape, you know, turn back time and play it again and then compare the results. We just kind of get what we get. And so if I'm someone who loses out in this decision, if I'm someone whose values aren't played out, whose, um, you know, whose, uh, whose job is lost or whose taxes go up, I'm going to be looking pretty carefully at that decision maker and saying, did you make that decision with integrity? Did you make it with respect for my circumstances? Did you take my perspective into consideration? And, uh, and did you get captured by some other stakeholder, some other special interest group? Um, and if I don't see some really good evidence, I'm going to start questioning whether you're actually acting in the public good. And I'm going to start distrusting whether uh, you're doing your job as a public official. So if I don't find, you know, one of, the, one of the big pieces of evidence that people start to look for now is whether a public co consultation occurred and what kind of pub public consultation it was. Um, so that's one of the bits of evidence, one of the reasons why decision makers are doing this is they're trying to provide evidence that they're going about these decisions in an effective way. But often it's unconvincing and what happens for that organization is, uh, and for those people, if it happens to enough of them, is that there's this sense of, you know, there's a loss of shared ownership, right? For a while, it was our hospital, our local hospital, our local school, right? our transit system, um, our city government. But if it seems like they've been captured by a special interest, it becomes somebody else's. It becomes theirs. Right? And so I'm going to be pretty suspicious about any story you're telling me. I think you're probably leaving some facts out here. Um, you're probably telling me a story that you want to tell to get my support, but I don't really trust that it's the whole story here. Uh, I'm much less likely to cooperate with you if I'm a partner or a stakeholder, a volunteer, a donor. Uh, I'm less likely to really be helpful. Um, and I'm less likely to give up uh, things for the greater good, right? You can make an argument that there might be a, a short-term pain for a long-term gain. Um, or a small sacrifice that I have to make that'll get a large benefit for some other people. But if I don't trust you, I'm not going to listen to that. Uh, so I think what this all means is that that organization then ends up losing um, their capacity for leadership, right? They, they can't act if people don't trust them and the things that they're saying and the things that they're doing. That's a, and that's a really dangerous thing for any public organization. So then how does, how does the organization see this, right? If they're sitting in their offices and the public starts to be doing this, the public comes across not as suspicious, they actually they come across as disinterested and kind of uninformed, right? They don't seem to be listening when I'm telling them things, even if I'm trying really hard to tell them something important. They seem emotional, right? They're volatile, they react oddly, I don't quite get it. They're unreasonable, they're unpredictable, polarized and divided, right? Everyone starts to squabble over the different aspects of, uh, of the question at hand. And if I'm a good public servant, and this is the public that I am dealing with, my natural and professional response is to treat it as a risk to be managed, right? I, they're getting in the way of me helping people's health, you know, teaching our children, getting people around this city. These people are in the way. So I start to manage the public as a risk. I limit information. I create a buffer zone between them, right? I sit myself over here and I put them at the far back of the room. I constrain the issues we can talk about. I constrain the feedback that they can provide. And that just becomes evidence, right? That whenever these people are making decisions, uh, they're not to be trusted. For anyone who's suspicious, all of those activities are the evidence I would be looking for, right? So I think this is, this is at the core of the problem of why we have public consultation happening, but it seems really useless to most of us. Citizens stop trusting government and governments stop trusting citizens. I think one other thing is lost when we start treating the public like this as a risk to be managed. We start losing the idea of public service, which is a really dangerous thing, right? If I think the public won't get it if I do a good job, 
I, how, how am I supposed to serve them, right? Like it, it becomes really hard to be a, a professional in that role when you see the people you're supposed to be serving is totally antithetical to your mission. And so I think this is really dangerous. Um, and I, I think we're starting to see it more and more in our public institutions, which is why we at Mass are so concerned about how to change it. And think that public consultation is actually a really good way to start changing that relationship but the public from treating them as a risk to treating them as a resource because they can be a resource if we treat them appropriately. We think people are caring. We think, I think you guys know this too, right? They're caring, they're reasonable, they're purposeful, they're curious. They care about their communities. They want to be something of big, be something, uh, be a part of something that is bigger than themselves. Uh, they want to contribute. They want to learn. They know that they don't know everything. Um, and we just need to give them an opportunity to show these characteristics uh, if we can design it appropriately. So some people uh, seem to think this is a little bit airy-fairy and touchy-feely. Uh, so I have to provide evidence, right? This is a, an evaluation uh, seminar or workshop. So I'm going to provide you with a little bit of evidence that we can actually set up interactions to focus on shared interests rather than just the narrow self-interest or group interest that I'm coming at. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to a TED talk um, by Barry Schwartz, who's a psychologist, uh, who's done some really interesting experiments about this to show actually how easy it is to shift people's mindsets about these things. Um, and then we'll come back and chat about what it means. In Switzerland, back in uh, about 15 years ago, they were trying to decide where to site nuclear waste dumps. There was going to be a national referendum, and some psychologists went around and polled citizens who were very well informed. And they said, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Astonishingly, 50% of the citizens said yes. They knew it or thought it was dangerous. They thought it would reduce their property values. But it had to go somewhere, and they had responsibilities as citizens. The psychologists asked other people a slightly different question. They said, if we paid you six weeks' salary every year, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Two reasons. It's my responsibility, and I'm getting paid. Instead of 50% saying yes, 25% said yes. What happens is that the second, this, the introduction of the incentive gets us so that instead of asking, what is my responsibility? All we ask is, what serves my interests? When incentive... Everyone catch that, right? So we ask people, just do you want to cite a nuclear waste dump? 50% said yes, which is odd, right? The Switzerland's weird. Um, <laughs> that's not a normal response. Uh, but they have, they have a civic culture there that is about responsibility to each other, right? We set up the question and say, will you do it? And we'll pay you. And half of those people who said yes now say no, because we've primed them to think about their self-interest and think about what's in it for me. Right? And I think you know, the, the point is around public consultation is we often set up our public consultations to prime people for self-interest. We say, what do you think? Right? Tell me what you think. Come and have your say. Right? Like this is all these subtle messages that are reinforcing the problem that we uh, are trying to stop. So we need to set up interactions so that we're focused on shared interests, on shared challenges, on collaborative solutions, rather than on self-interest and on group interest. How can we do that? I'm trying to break this vicious cycle. So what I'm going to do for the next little while is talk about um, some of our thinking at MassLBP about how we go about doing this. I'm going to talk you through four goals that I think anyone could use when they're setting out to, to design a public engagement strategy, uh, and four questions that they should ask, design questions, um, that I think will help surface that idea of setting up things for uh, shared interests and collaborative work. Uh, and then I'll go into a description of how we use those principles, but I'm not putting these methods forward as a solution for all of you and all your organizations. It's just how we do it. Um, and I think they're interesting examples, and they work. Uh, in many cases, and so we can talk about them. Um, but the point is to take these questions and these goals and use them in your own way, in a way that fits your organization and fits uh, the troubles that you're facing or the challenge that you're trying to solve. So one is this idea of useful recommendations. It seems kind of obvious right now, but um, it turns out that most public consultations don't come up with anything useful, right? And so if that's the case, and if you're planning a public engagement, um, 
and you think you're not going to get anything useful, that's a, like the first thing you should do to stop and, and revisit your planning and think anew about how to go about this differently. Um, so it should be an, an early warning sign. The second is this idea of enhanced transparency and institutional trust. Right? This is what we've been talking about. We want people to walk out of that meeting or walk out of that survey uh, you know, after they, after they log off of their computer, uh, whatever it is that they're doing, we want them to feel that they trust you and that you've, be, they've been, you've been more open than expected uh, with them. Right? So if you can take that up a notch, then that's a good thing. The third goal is uh, this weird thing that we came up with called democratic fitness. Uh, but the idea here is that it's actually, it's actually hard to work together on shared problems, right? Like it's not, it's not simple, you snap your finger and everyone gets along. Um, it's a muscle that requires working out. Uh, and so the idea of democratic fitness is, have we set up a process that helps people get better at understanding others, at expressing their own concerns, uh, and coming together to find what they share? in a solution, right? this idea of democratic fitness. And then the fourth goal for engagement should be to focus inward on your own organization and say, are we learning something from this? Are we changing our culture, however slightly, towards being more accepting of public input and more uh, able to be open and trusting of them? Are we changing our assumptions about what the public is? And if your process or your meeting isn't changing your own organization for the better, then it's another good reason to stop. Uh, it should at least be a test, right? You should be learning something uh, from your engagement with the public. Four design questions. One, who's participating and how did they get involved? Um, the point here is you can't have a good conversation if the right people aren't in the room, and you can't work on shared challenges if it doesn't feel like this represents the public. Right? Like I, Mary and I were chatting about this um, before we started. This is a, a room full of women, um, which, is, which is great. You guys are all wonderful. Um, but if I was hosting a public meeting, I'd think there's something wrong here, right? Like we've missed out on 49 whatever percent of the population. Um, and we can't sit around and ennoble the work that we're doing as representatives of everybody else if we don't look and feel like the public itself. Um, so I'd ask myself, how did these people get invited, right? How did they get involved? And it's also the first opportunity to set the tone, right? That invitation that you send out. Um, so you're setting the right tone. Are you asking for their opinion or to work on behalf of others? Right? Again, this is about priming people to be thinking about their responsibility, not just to themselves, but to those people, those other people in the room and the people who weren't there in the first place. The, answer, the right answer here is to, to ask people to work on behalf of others. The point isn't to say, leave your perspective at the door. It's important that you bring your perspective to the table. But it's about figuring out a way to balance it with everybody else's perspective and put yourself as one among many. Is there a real task? Right? I think a lot of the times we end up hosting a meeting uh, you know, way after the decision has been made. Um, or we just do it because we're supposed to. Right? And there's actually nothing for people to do. And people know it. If you get, they get in the room and, and you just say, you know, what do you think? Um, they're like, well, why am I here? Why am I giving up two hours that I could be spending with my family or my friends um, working on something that you don't seem to care about? You know, people are pretty smart about this. They can sniff out the bullshit really quickly. Um, and then fourth, what learning needs to occur? And this is really important. And it really should be number one uh, on these design questions. But we often forget that all the things that are background knowledge for us are totally not understood by people, right? So like the size of um, the provincial budget or the responsibilities of a city or uh, things that you uh, get for free in the public health care system and things that you don't. Um, all that stuff is totally new to people. Or, you know, we often put up a, a picture of a, a population pyramid, right? You can see the baby boom. You can see it moving up and say, OK, what's going to happen when these people retire? Um, that's totally new insight for a lot of people. Uh, and if it's the public that you've gathered, many of them haven't finished high school, right? Or, uh, or have been to college for a year. <clears throat> so you need to figure out a way to teach these things in a way that, that will connect with them. Not in our language as policymakers, but in a language that makes sense to them. 
So that's the fourth design question to keep in mind. So I'm going to quickly run through three of our methodologies. <coughs> um, excuse me. To give you an example of how we do this. Uh, and then I'll wrap up and we'll take a break and we'll answer questions and have a discussion. Um, but the first is a civic lottery and we call it a civic lottery because we want people to feel happy and excited when they win. Um, but it's a way to randomly and representatively select people to participate in a, a process um, from a given public, a community. So I'm going to talk more about that. The second is a citizen's reference panel. We call it a reference panel because the government or the public agency is referring a question to a group of people. So it's a, a real clear task. And then those people are referring back a set of recommendations. And they're often referring that back after three, four, five Saturdays spent together working with my team of facilitators, uh, learning about the issue and talking together to come up with recommendations. Um, so it's a big ask. We're asking people to give up like five Saturdays to talk about something that might have no real impact on their life like public transit, though it impacts them, but funding for public transit or uh, priorities for a local health system. Um, but people turn out and they care. <clears throat> so that's the citizen reference panel. I'll talk more about that. And the third is a public round table, which is our version of a, a town hall meeting. So I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that. But the, the point is to, in a public round table, um, is to try to create as much bandwidth for informed and respectful citizen to citizen dialogue. And if you, thought, if you can remember that example of the town hall that we created with the decision maker down and the microphones at one end, there was like no citizen to citizen dialogue. Um, so how do we create a meeting where that happens? Civic lottery, right. Uh, so these are personal invitations to John or Joan um, to participate in this panel. They're from someone important, the CEO of a hospital, the Minister of Consumer Services, um, you know, the head of a region, um, and it's help shape the future of Ontario's health system, right? There's a clear call, there's a clear task. Uh, we send out five to 10,000 of these randomly to randomly selected addresses across the region. So, um, you know, it might be Ontario, it might be a whole province, it might be a town, um, but we'll send out five or 10,000 of them asking people to respond. These are them coming off the presses. Um, and they're full of all of these materials, right? It's, it's a, a bulky package to say, like, this is really something weighty that we're dealing with here, right? And it's, it's tangible. And we're asking you personally, when was the last time you were, like, personally invited to come to a public meeting? Like, it's, an, it's an odd thing, right? And so I think it jars people. It says, this is weird. I just received a, minute, a, a letter from the minister. Uh, and they said, I need your help with this clear task. And it says not, um, you know, we want you to come and share your opinion. It says, Come and work on behalf of others, right? Come and bring your perspectives and represent all of those who aren't at the table. And those messages are clearly in this to help indicate to people what kind of a task this is and set up the tone of the interaction as we go forward. And then there's a little envelope, the postage is paid, people can drop this Kennet response card in the mail, it comes back to us, we put their information into a computer or they can give us a call at a 1-800 number. Um, we'll use logos, you know, the Ontario logo you can see there. Um, <clears throat> to try to make this feel official, because it is. It's official and important, and people, right, this is direct mail. Uh, they may not open it if they don't think it's important, so we try to make it feel weighty. And these are often brown, because um, tax envelopes are brown. And people open it. <laughs> <laughs> tricky, tricky, right? Our, our, our director of, of this process used to work at the Walrus Magazine. Uh, so Canada's you know, premier kind of uh, long-form journalism, and he was their director of, um, of uh, what the title was, but he was in charge of maintaining their membership lists, right? And so got knew all the tricks of mailing people those reminders and saying, 99 cents for the first month, you know, that sort of stuff. So we use this stuff here to get people to actually get the message. <clears throat> so we send out five to 10,000 of them, we get people to volunteer, and then we only select, if it's a citizen reference panel, we'll select 24 to 36 of them to come together for that three or four days. And we balance that selection for age, for gender and geography, right? So the age matches the distribution of the public, the geography looks like the community that we're representing. If it's Ontario, it matches the population of Ontario. Um, and gender, half and half, male and women, men and women. <clears throat> um, and yeah, those are the three, the three issues we, we use. Uh, some people always ask, you know, um, 
What about income? What about education? Right? What about ethnicity? Those seem to be important factors if you're going to have a public deliberation. Um, and I think that's something that we always kind of keep in the back of our head. But after doing about 20 of these, uh, it always comes out within 3 or 4 or 5%. Um, you take a look at the room when those people get together and you read their biographies and they feel like Toronto. They feel like Kingston. Uh, Kingston's old and white um, if you're down there. Um, but uh, you really get a sense that that's, that's who the community is. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about the Civic Lottery for now. So the Citizens Reference Panel. Um, again, 24 to 36 people gathering for three or four days. Uh, they're working with a team of facilitators. Um, some of my colleagues are in that one. We've run these uh, in BC, in Alberta, in Ontario, um, plenty of cities and regions across the province here. Um, here's one in this very room, uh, which is a lovely facility. You've got all these nice windows. Um, that's my colleague Peter. Um, and uh, we work through uh, uh, five steps. The first one is convening, which we've already talked about. We use a civic lottery to convene this group of people together. The second is a learning phase, right? What do people need to learn? And we'll often spend like a good third of the time on that. Um, consult, we ask people to go out and talk to other people about the issue. Deliberation and recommendations. So learning, um, like I said, a good third of this is learning. Uh, we'll bring in uh, a wide variety of experts frontline workers, stakeholders, uh, advocates on whatever the issue is and have them talk and really have a conversation with those 36 people. Uh, we have to train those people not to use jargon and uh, to talk simply and to tell people what the point is. Um, but once we give them some tips and tricks about talking to regular folks, they do a pretty good job. Uh, and then we run activities to help people kind of process this, right? They're getting a ton of information and they're learning like a couple of university courses worth of stuff in a day or two, uh, so we help them along. And our job is to learn along with them. We're not experts in any of these issues. We learn beside them and, uh, and help make sure that they're clear about what's going on. Second is citizen to citizen consultation. Um, we sometimes use citizen to citizen consultation in a town hall, you know, a round table meeting. I'll talk a little bit about that. But even if there's not a round table meeting as part of a citizen reference panel, we ask people in between those weekends to go home and talk to their colleagues and talk to their friends and talk to their family about the issue and bring their perspectives back to the table. Um, and the point of this is not only to reach more people, right? You can often get those 36 people to reach out to 500 or 700 other folks in the process of one of these uh, panels, but it's a learning experience to have to be, take responsibility for those people who you talked to and start to work for them, not just for you. Right? You balance out your own perspective with theirs. So another kind of little change in mindset as we work towards recommendations. Deliberation. Uh, we spend a good chunk of time during those days working on different activities. And you know, um, I was thinking when, when Mary was telling us about the maps, uh, we'll often just like throw post-its on a wall, right? And spend it without, there's no, sophisticated computer. I wish we had a sophisticated computer who could, who could do it for us. <laughs> and we throw it up on the wall and people are sorting and moving things around and trying to figure out, right? We all have these different issues. We have these different concerns. We have these different values. What's the areas where we, um, where we find some common ground? And that's the point of this. And the point is that there are tough choices, right? We're not all going to agree. If it's a hard issue, we shouldn't all agree, right? That's kind of the point is that reasonable people will disagree about this. Um, but we want to work out all of the different angles as much as possible so people feel like they've been heard uh, and people feel like they've been given the benefit of the group's thinking on whatever issue it is. They make recommendations. They actually write their own recommendations for the government, right? This all goes into a report um, written by that panel which goes to the public agency and says this is what you should do on the problem that you've given us. Uh, and we do this, we work towards near consensus um, by writing as a group, a small group, one of these tables, and then presenting to the group, getting feedback, and then rewriting, and then presenting, and then rewriting and presenting until everyone's relatively happy. And sometimes, I was saying near consensus, we don't want full consensus. If it's full consensus, there's probably something wrong. Uh, we probably don't have the right people necessarily. We haven't taught them enough about the issue. Um, if they can all agree, then something is going on uh, that isn't good. Uh, but we want uh, a strong majority 
uh, that people are able to find some ground for consensus. And those that disagree uh, can write their own report, a minority report that explains their perspectives and also goes to um, the decision maker. So for them to take a look at both uh, the majority and the minority. And then we always end with public recognition because I think it's really important to thank people. Right? They've just given up all these Saturdays. Uh, and thank them with like a certificate and a handshake from someone who's really important. So you often have the minister come and do this uh, or the head of the hospital or you know, get a few people together and we'll, we'll do a ceremony and we'll shake hands. It's like a little graduation ceremony. Um, and we'll send them off saying, you know, thank you very much for all that you've done, not, not just for yourselves in this group, but for the community at large. Uh, so people always ask, um, does the agency have to do what they recommend? Uh, no, they don't. Um, and that's the point. It's not citizens' job to decide. This isn't a crass form of populism. Um, this is about trying to inform the decision maker as best as possible about the community's informed perspectives. Uh, and so what we do is we sign a dual contract with our client to say that their job is to acknowledge that they received the report, to respond to it and explain what they agree with and what they don't, and to act on those things that they are in line with. Okay. So we're running one of these panels in BC right now, or we, we just finished, and the government is now working on their response. They have 60 days, apparently. They're all frantically trying to figure out what they're going to say. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. So here's a few examples of the types of reference panels we've run. Uh, a hospital had persistent operating deficits, and they needed to cut some clinical services. It's a community hospital. Uh, cancer care transformation, how do we experience, or we improve the patient experience? Ministry of Consumer Services, how do we rewrite the Condominium Act um, to provide new legislation for these self-government self-governed communities in Ontario. Right? One in 10 people live in a condo these days, and there's a, an act, a legislation, that says, here's the board, and here's how you vote, and here's the financial rules for a condo. So um, review that and fix it. And then Metrolink's Transportation Authority, right? How do we fund publicly uh, the next 25 years of transportation in this region? Right? What are the tools that we should use? Taxes and tolls and things like that. So we had a group of people work for uh, several days on that question. So, uh, public roundtables, quickly. I know I'm probably running out of time. Um, again, create citizen to citizen dialogue, make it social, focus on learning, give people choice. Right, the point is you know, to try to create as much space for people to talk. If this is part of a citizen reference panel, we have the members of the panel actually facilitating tables. Uh, so there's a lot of citizen to citizen dialogue going on. Uh, but the point, again, is to get people talking about the issues and exploring different perspectives. If, um, if it's not uh, part of a citizen reference panel, we'll have a, a staffed facilitator. There's a really high ratio of staff facilitators to participant to help manage that conversation. So every table has one of our trained um, staff members participating, that's Sharif there. And his job is really to act as kind of a dinner table host, right? Which is a much more natural way to have a conversation than across a hall. Uh, so we get people sitting around a big table and he welcomes them and has them introduce people and people grab a cup of coffee and have a conversation. And it turns out that people feel much more comfortable talking about tough issues if you make it natural to them. Um, and focus on learning, right? So when we were running this for Metrolinks, we ran 12 of these meetings across uh, the GTHA. We built this little box full of cards and maps and things so that when people were getting confused or having trouble working through their, uh, their differences of opinion, um, the facilitator could pull these maps out and cards and say, okay, are you talking about this or this? Let's compare these projects. What about subways versus LRTs versus streetcar? What are the facts? Uh, and actually guide any, um, any difficult point towards learning, right? It's usually what is needed when there's disagreement, at least in the beginning, is to learn more about the issue and learn more about the concerns of the other person so we really understand what's going on. And choice. Um, one of the great things about having 12 tables is you can have 12 different themes. And people can get the conversation that they came for because they can choose the table they want to go to and just move to the table that they want to. So use the law of two feet and people will naturally find the spot that they want to go and have the conversation that they meant to and walk away feeling really good. And then all of that feedback gets gathered up and synthesized either in the CRP, right in the reference panel, or by our facilitators and written up into a report. So to summarize, a lot of public consultation is useless. 
this is the problem. This is what we need to do. These are our goals. Remember them. These are our questions. Public engagement does not equal communications. It's not a communications exercise. Right? Public engagement is shared learning. It's public leadership. People want to say, but they're also willing to serve. And the problem isn't that we ask too much of people, but often too little. So that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to give you my email, my phone number, get in touch if you want to chat more. Uh, we're just down on King Street, so come by. Thanks. Do you need me to hold on to this, or how are we going to do? Um, we going to run around with it? That's, that's OK. You can just put it in the middle between the two of you. <laughs> Thanks. Here, we'll stand this close together. Sure, OK, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> um, one thing I really enjoyed very, very much is that, is that I've, I felt like basically saying what he said. What he said, yes, and that too. Because these are really fundamental philosophical, practical, and political ways of, of looking at engagement, of looking at how one is perceived by power structures and how one can then take responsibility for being part of the, part of the informing. And each of these ways is perfectly, perfectly right. I mean, there are many things around the International Association of Facilitators. Are any of you folks involved with that group? Do you know of, of mm -hmm. them? Yeah. And they, they do a lot of this work, but, but one of the things that they don't do is to open the thinking, to be more innovative about how one accesses people's points of, of interest and need. And the concept of asking more of people rather than less is something that we find very often as well. If we have the opportunity to get people really to think about what this might mean, not for themselves necessarily, but for a context larger than themselves, a system issue, a big problem, a thorny concern, then they are much more inclined to kick into gear and to say, yes, I'll be there, yes, I can do that, and yes, I can tell you this. And that, that really resonates. So these are really natural but really well described and well organized. Um, means to, to seek and value voice, which is what we're trying to, to look at. That's great. Alex, your reaction My pleasure. I, I was thinking, I was scribbling many notes when Mary was presenting. One of the things that she talked about was this idea of therapeutic planning, yeah. which I loved the concept of. Yeah. Um, and and the, the therapy that we're describing is like a kind of um, couples therapy, right? Like it's therapy between the public and the, the, the government. Um, but I think there's all sorts of therapeutic planning that needs to be done in terms of the relationships in our community. Yeah. And it's our job and responsibilities as planners and um, uh, public authorities, right? We work in organizations that have authority to do things, to take on that responsibility. And mapping is a great way to help show people what's going on and open up the process and bring them in. Yeah. And so I was really excited to see, like I said, uh, a computer program that could do some of this stuff for yeah. me, but also that the computer program is just a part of it, right? Absolutely. It's a little bit Absolutely. of it, and the important part is how you design it, how you think about the problem, yeah. and then how you use it afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you do exactly. a good job of both of those sides, then that's a great tool to use. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly so. And when we think about the design of to, to capture voice, we still need to look at those questions that we talked about at the end of this, which I think are relevant to yeah, both of us. Turn back to we this. believe these things philosophically and politically and so on, but we really should investigate, while we have you all here, we should investigate your thinking as a, as a sort of a panel. Now you get to be the panel, and we'll be the recipients of your knowledge. <laughs> what are the obstacles? What are the barriers? What are some things that you know about about reaching beyond those obstacles to achieve true voice in a context. So we want to hear from you about that. So why don't I switch back to that on the slide? Great. And we'll take a and minute take to grab and coffee and yep. people need to go to the washroom or things like that. And then we'll have a conversation, Sanji. Yeah. So, so in about five minutes, uh, we'll be as, back. as Mary points out, love to hear from your, your stories of community engagement. Uh, not just as an end in itself, but if there is a we have made the journey to actually using community engagement to impact systems. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to hear about that. Uh, I'm curious, it's a question I'm going to come to both of you two. Uh, where have been the surprises? A lot of it seems, seems obvious, 
a lot of it is uh, emergent, as you say. I'd yes. like to see where the emergence actually happened. Yeah. Uh, and here's the tough question, and this is something that bothers me. Uh, very often, I've actually seen community engagement as a means to co-opt, as a means to uh, keep the status quo. Yep. Uh, and so, so I would actually go it's beyond. It's useless. Uh, it's actually harmful. Counterproductive. Uh, yeah, and so, so I would love to hear stories from you. So these are not just question-answer sessions, but truly a dialogue. See you in about five. Thank you.